I'm your host and coordinator for this question and answer session and I would coordinate the whole session between the audience and our speaker for the day, Dr. Zakir Naik. To derive more benefit for all present here today in the limited time available, we would request you to kindly observe the following rules and regulations. Questions asked should be on the topic, Al-Quran should it be read with understanding only. Questions not relevant to the topic would not be entertained. Kindly state your question briefly and to the point. This is a question and answer session and not a lecture time. Only one question at a time may be asked. For your second question, you would have to go back of the row where you're queuing up to ask your second question. Three mics have been provided in the auditorium for questions from the audience. Two for the gents on my left and right next to the stage and one above in the balcony for the ladies. Please stand in queue at one of the mics if you wish to put a question to the speaker and speak into the mic only when the mic is handed to you by the mic handling assistants. We will allow one question on each of the mics in a clockwise rotation. Written questions on slip papers which are available from our volunteers in the aisles as well as on the stage would be given secondary preference after the questions on the mics are answered by Dr. Zakir. In the interest of having a less time wasting, a more educative and an interesting question and answer session, our decision to allow or disallow irrelevant questions would be final. In the interest of eliciting an appropriate answer from Dr. Zakir, it is requested that you kindly state your name and profession before putting forward your question. Maybe we begin with the first question from the ladies section, please. Dada, why do certain surahs of the Quran begin with Alif, Lam, Meen or Yaseen? What is its significance? Could you explain it? The sister asked the question that what is the meaning of certain letters which are present in the beginning of the surahs like Alif, Lam, Mim, Yasin, Hami, what is its significance? These letters are known as the Muqattat or the abbreviated letters. And if you analyze, totally there are 29 Arabic letters in the Arabic language. If you count Hamza and Alif as two letters. And if you analyze in the Holy Quran, out of the 114 surahs, 29 of the surahs also contain these abbreviated letters. Sometimes it occurs individually, sometimes in combination of twos, threes, fours, maximum is in combination of five. If you analyze, it occurs alone in three surahs as Saad, Qaf, Noon, it occurs in combinations of two in ten different surahs as Taha, Fasin, Yasin, and as Hamim in seven surahs. It occurs in the combination of three abbreviated letters in three different combinations as Alif Lam Mim in total six surahs, as Alif Lam Ra in six surahs, as Ta Sin Mim in two surahs. It occurs in the combination of four abbreviated letters in two different surahs and as combination of five in another two surahs. And many surahs even contain more than one combination. The basic question is, what is the meaning? What is the significance of these abbreviated letters? There have been books and volumes and volumes of literature written only on what do they mean? Volumes and volumes. I'll just mention a few that some say it is a short form 
for certain words. For example, noon is a short form for noor. Some say it's a sign of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Some say it's a short form for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Some say it's the name of the titles of surah, like how we have Yasin, it's title of a surah. Some say that it has been used for rhyming, for rhyming purposes to make the Quran more rhythmic. Some others say that these Arabic letters, they have got some numerical values. Therefore, it indicates some numerical code. While some people say that these abbreviated letters, they were used by Archangel Gabriel to attract the attention of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and today it's due to attract the attention of the readers. There are various reasons given. But the best and the most logical reason, which I agree with, is the same which was also given and agreed upon by Ibn Qasir, as well as by Zamakshari, as well as by Ibn Taymiyyah. All these are great scholars and commentators of the Holy Quran. The Holy Quran says in Surah Al-Imran, chapter 3, verse number 7, that some of the verses of the Holy Quran, they are well established. Some are mutashabiyat, some are not well established. Like for example, Qul Allahu Ahad. It's a very well established ad. There's no two opinion about it. It is that say he's Allah one and only. Some ayats are not well established like Alif Lam Mim, Yasin, Ta, Noon, Qaf, various others. But you should analyze that since the Holy Quran says we have made the Quran easy for you to understand, all these not well established ayats, their meaning is based on some other established verse of the Holy Quran. The best commentary of the Holy Quran is the Quran itself. The answer to these will be found somewhere else in the Holy Quran. The reason given by these scholars, which I agree is the best answer, is that when the Quran was revealed, Arabic was at its peak. The Arabs were very proud of the language. The thing that they were most proud was of the language. Arabic was at its zenith. The Arabs of that time, they were proud of the language. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Alif, Lam, Mim, Yasin, Ha, Mim, Noon, Kaf, how we say A, B, C, D, F, L, M. Allah is telling them, these are your letters. This Arabic is your language. You are so proud of it. With your language, Alif, Lam, Mim, Yasin, Ta, Sin, Ha, Mim, and Allah gives a challenge. In Surah Baqarah, chapter 2, verse number 23 and 24, it says, in kuntum fi mimma nazzalna ala abdina, and if you are in doubt as what we have produced to our servant Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam from time to time, fatu bi suratim bi misli, then produce a surah somewhat similar to it. Wad u shawda ko min dunillah in kuntum sadiqin, and call forth your helpers and witnesses if there are any besides Allah. Fa illam taf alu, and if we cannot, walam taf alu, and of a surety you cannot. Then fear the fire whose fuel is men and stone which is prepared for those who reject faith. So Allah is giving a challenge that this is your language, you Arabs, it's your language, Alif, Lam, Mim, Ta, Sin, Ha, Mim. With your alphabets, with your letters, I have produced the Quran. Allah gives the challenge with your Arabic, try and produce a single surah somewhat similar to the Holy Quran. Not the full Quran. Allah gives a challenge that try and produce a single surah somewhat similar to the Holy Quran. And some surahs are hardly three verses. The shortest surah contains in ten words. So Allah gives the challenge that with these letters I have produced the Holy Quran. I challenge you to produce a surah somewhat similar to the Holy Quran. Many people tried but they failed miserably. To give you an example, the human body the components and elements of the human body is present in the soil in a lesser or greater quantity. But there's a world of a difference between the human body and the soil and the earth. Do the components are same? What component the human body contains, the elements, the chemical, you can go in the market and purchase it. You can add a few gallons of water to it, but you cannot give life. Only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can give life. The components are same. You can purchase it from the market for a couple of thousand rupees or even less. But you cannot give life. You cannot 
make the circulation system work, the nervous system work. The components are present, but you can't give life. Only Allah can give. In the same way, Allah says, these are your letters. Alif, Lam, Mim, Ha, Mim, Ya, Sin. With your letters, I have produced the Holy Quran. It's a challenge to the whole of humankind along with the jinn to try and produce a single surah somewhat similar to the Holy Quran. And that's the reason that whenever these abbreviated letters occur in the Holy Quran, immediately after these words, there is a quality of the Holy Quran mentioned. For example, in Surah Baqarah chapter 2, verse number 1 and 2, it says, Alif, Lam, Mim, Zalik al Kitab ula rai bafi. That means, Alif, Lam, Mim, this is a book in which there is guidance without doubt. Quran says in Surah Al Ibrahim, chapter 14, verse number 1, Alif, Lam, Ra. This is a book we reveal to thee to lead the human beings from darkness to light giving you the quality of the Quran, that Quran can lead the human beings from darkness to light. Therefore, whenever these abbreviated letters are mentioned, after it is the quality of the Holy Quran. Otherwise, Allah alam, Allah knows the best. Assalamu alaikum. I am Riyaz Vodkaunkar. Uh, let me call you, uh, first of all, Sir uh, Zakir Naik. Uh, so my question is, for every letter of Quran we recite, we get sawab, all the blessings. Does that mean that reciting Iblis, 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 which is also mentioned in Quran, uh, that person will get blessings also? The first of all, the question, that as it's mentioned in the Sahih Hadith, as I mentioned in my talk in Tirmidhi, Hadith number 1003, that every letter of the Quran you recite, you get sawab. Brothers ask the question, does it mean that if I recite Iblis, 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 which mentioned in the Holy Quran, will I also get sawab? Brother, if you recite Iblis, 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 as though you made a tasbih, glorifying him, you won't get sawab. But if you recite Iblis with understanding, and realizing that Iblis is a Satan, Iblis is a devil, he's an evil one, he's an enemy to you, then inshallah you'll get sawab. Mr. Chairman, sir. The next question from Friends, the brother and the friend. Gentlemen, my name is Ashok Kishorani. I am presently editing a Sindhi journal, Arya Mark. I am a student of Islamic teachings. Before I ask my question, with the kind permission of the chair, I would like to recite Kalma Pak and from Holy Quran and with Om Bhur Bhuvahaswa Tatsavit Varinyam Bargo Devasya Devay Deo Yuna Prachu Dayat La La Illa La Muhammad Rasulullah Bismillah Allah Rahman Rahim I also salute Dr. Zakir Hussain's computer erudition and didactic disposition with open-mindedness and scientific temper of tolerance and understanding. And ladies and gentlemen, here is my question. From the core question before us, Al-Quran, should it be read with understanding? Having understood and taken for granted that all along these past 400 and odd years of Quranic Islamic existence, the Holy Quran has been read and not under, of, and often misunderstood and positively and negatively acted upon without proper understanding. And now, though low, late in the day, uh, realizing that less, the question is being very thoughtfully framed in the light of logical understanding of the Vedas, the universal accepted oldest books in human library, that should Quran be read with understanding. And now I humbly ask from the world's best scholar of religions, Dr. Zakir Hussain Sahab, question is, which are these Ghaznavi, Gori, Temur type warmongering misunderstood verses of our Holy Quran? And can you give us proper peace-giving meaning for words, harmony, happiness, comma? And along with those passages, which give permit for non-wage push when once in our Islamic research foundation, you had agreed 
that a complete vegetarian and a teetotaler can also remain a complete and devout Muslim. Please, Dr. Oblai. I would request uh, Brother Zakir to uh, briefly make it comprehensive and uh, the question and then answer. The brother has asked several questions. And I'm wondering which one to answer. But he made some comments before posing the question. He said that Quran has never been understood since the past 1400 years, which I don't agree with him. The Holy Quran, Alhamdulillah, was understood earlier. People, most of them, they read with understanding earlier. That is the reason if you have heard my talk on Quran and modern science, I've spoken on various scientific facts mentioned in the Holy Quran. So people ask me, that does it mean that if the Quran mentions so many scientific facts, why are the Muslims backward? Alhamdulillah, the Muslims were not backward. When the Quran were revealed, the Europeans from the 8th to the 12th century, they call it as the Dark Ages. It was dark for the Europeans, not for the world. The Muslims, alhamdulillah, were far advanced. And with whatever knowledge they acquired from the Holy Quran, the Hadith, they made phenomenal research which is commendable with the limited resources they had, the amount of research they made. So, Alhamdulillah, Muslims were at the peak. Now, since the past few years, the link between the Muslims and the Quran has weakened. There are many Muslims who read the Quran with understanding, but the majority don't. That's why we gave this talk. So, if you ask me that why are the Muslims today? Why are they backward? The reason, brother, is that the Muslims have got backward today is because we have gone away from a religious book, the Holy Quran. And the reason the Westerners have advanced is because they too have gone away from the religious book. <laughs> Coming to your question, if I can summarize, you pose two important questions. One is on harmony, and one you quoted regarding non-vegetarian. And you quoted certain verses of the Vedas. This is not a talk. It is mainly Al-Quran, Shubhira's understanding. Regarding the other topics, we have other lectures. And inshallah, I can even comment on the Vedas. But today, since you mainly asked that what the Quran speaks about harmony, though it doesn't fall under the topic, but the chairperson said, I should answer, so it's my job. The chairperson makes a decision, yes or no. The Quran speaks about several things about harmony. And I've given the talk on Islam and universal brotherhood. Islam, the universal religion. And the best verse I can quote for universal harmony is from Surah Hujurat, chapter 49, verse number 13, which says, Ya ayyuwa nasu, inna khalaq naakum, min zakin wa unsa wa ja'al naakum, shawm ba'u wa qaba'ila li ta'arifu, inna akramakum, inna allahi atkakum, inna allaha alimun kabir. That, O oh, humankind, we have created you from a single pair of male and female and have divided you into nations and tribes so that you shall recognize each other, not that you shall despise each other. And the most honored in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the person who has taqwa, who has righteousness, who has piety, who has God consciousness. The criteria to judge a person who is superior than the other human being, it is not caste, it's not color, it's not creed, it's not sex, it's not wealth, it's not age, but it is taqwa. It's God consciousness. It's piety. So a person who's more God conscious, a person who's more God conscious, then he has higher level of taqwa. How to be God conscious? I've given a talk, and inshallah we'll be having, after a month's time, a talk on how to be God conscious on the basis of the Quran, on the basis of the Veda, on the basis of the Bible, on the basis of the other religious scriptures, inshallah. We practically show the difference between Islam and the other religions is Islam practically shows how a person should have universal brotherhood. Every day in our salah, five times when we offer salah, we stand shoulder to shoulder. Our beloved Prophet said, it's mentioned in Sahih Bukhari, Hadith number 692 of chapter number 75, volume number one in the book of Adan. Our beloved Prophet said, when you stand for salah, stand shoulder to shoulder. And the Hadith says, stand shoulder to shoulder so that the devil does not come in between you. 
Our prophet was not talking about the devil which you see in the Onida TV ad with two horns and a tail. He was not talking about the devil which you see in the comic strip. He was talking about the devil of racism, of caste, of color, of wealth, irrespective whether rich or poor. Irrespective whether a person is rich or poor, when he stands for Salah, he stands shoulder to shoulder. Whether the king or the pauper, when he stands in the same row, he stands shoulder to shoulder. Irrespective whether he's a European or an Indian, whether he's an African, whether black or white, when he stands for Salah, he stands shoulder to shoulder. The best universal example which we portray practically, other religions talk about it, theoretical. Practically, every year in Hajj, 2.5 million people from throughout the world, they gather together from various parts of the world, from America, from Japan, from England, from India, from Pakistan, from Sri Lanka, from Malaysia, from Indonesia. They're dressed up in two pieces of unsewn cloth, the men, preferably white. You can't identify the person who's doing Hajj with you, whether he's king or a pauper. Universal brotherhood, international brotherhood. Regarding more details, you can refer to my video cassette. Regarding a talk and a question that a Muslim can be a good Muslim, as I mentioned when you had come once to a foundation, even by being a pure wedge, and I agree with you, that a Muslim can be a very good Muslim by even being a pure vegetarian. But same way, a Muslim can be a very good Muslim by not being a doctor also. A Muslim can be a very good Muslim by not being an engineer also. A Muslim can be a very good Muslim by not being a lawyer also. That does not mean a person should not become a doctor. That does not mean a person should not become an engineer. That does not mean a person should not become a lawyer. A person can be a very good Muslim by being a vegetarian also. But why do we Muslims have non-veg is the answer to be given. Why? The reason why we Muslims have non-veg is because the Quran gives permission. Each of the good things we have provided. The Quran says in Surah Maida, chapter 5, verse number 1, that you're allowed to have the cattle, four-footed cattle, except with the names mentioned. So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also says in Surah Mu'minun, chapter 23, verse number 21, it says that verily in the cattle is a sign for you. We give you to drink a milk coming from the body, and of the meat you can eat. Not you should eat, you can eat. Now why does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Islam allow a person to have non veg The reason is that if you analyze the set of teeth of the carnivorous animal, the tiger, the leopard, the tiger, the leopard, the lion, they have got pointed teeth, carnivorous set of teeth. They only have non veg they can't have veg. The set of teeth of the herbivorous animal, the cow, the sheep, the goat, they have flat teeth. They can only have vegetables, they can't have non veg but if you go to the mirror and see the set of teeth of the human beings in the mirror, <laughs> we have pointed teeth as well as flat teeth. We have an omnivorous set of teeth, carnivore as well as herbivore. If God Almighty, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted us to have only vegetables, why did he give us pointed teeth? For what? <laughs> the digestive system of the human beings can digest both non-veg and veg. The digestive system of the carnivorous animal cannot digest vegetables. The digestive system of the herbivorous animal cannot digest non-veg. If Allah wanted us, if God Almighty wanted us to have only vegetables, why did he give us a digestive system which can digest both? Why? His brothers asked the question that if you eat raw, you cannot have raw. Let the answer get over, brother. You're most welcome to pose the second question. You can come behind the line. Because this I've given a full talk on vegetable system. Full talk. We have discussed for us together with great scholars of Hinduism and other religions. For us together. So there are answers for everything, but there's a question answer time. Brother said that you eat raw. You can't eat raw. I'm saying even if you cook the non-veg and give it to a cow, she can't digest. That's the reason you know the mad cow disease. You know mad cow disease? UK was in problems. Billions of pounds in loss. Why? They tried to give non-veg food to a herbivorous animal. <laughs> so similarly, if you analyze, the set of teeth and the dietary system God gave us is because for a purpose. Similarly, if you analyze, if you analyze the Hindu scriptures, the Hindu scriptures say that a person can have non-veg. 
If you read the Ayodhya Khandam, I'm giving the reference. The person is a Hindu. Ayodhya Khandam, chapter number 20, chapter number 26, chapter number 9, says that Ram, when he was sent for Banwas, when Ram was sent for Banwas, he said, I will have to sacrifice my tasty meat dishes. If Ram said he'll have to sacrifice tasty meat dishes, that means he had. So when Ram can have, why can't you have? There are various. <laughs> Further, if you analyze that in the story of Ramayana, in the story of Ramayana, Sita asked Ram to kill the buck. For what? Some people say for pet. What will Sita do with a dead pet? She asked Ram to kill the buck to eat the meat. The reason why the Hindus have gone to the philosophy of vegetarian, there is a reason. Because other ways of life had influence, like Jainism, etc. They had influence on the Hindus. So to prevent them from going to other ways of life, even many Hindus started adopting a system of vegetarianism. The reason which these philosophies of life give, when you ask them, why don't you have non-veg? They say, see brother, you know, killing living creature is wrong. I say, I agree with you. Killing living creature is wrong. It's a sin. Therefore, having vegetables is better than doing a sin and killing animals. I say, I agree with you. If you can survive in this world without killing living creatures, I am with you. But I tell them, the plants that you have, today science tells us, even they have got life. Again, brother is interjecting. I think the person, I think brother, I have told you clearly in English, that please don't interject. I can give the answer. Not that I can't give the answer. Even the animals have got no soul. <laughs> See, brother, this is my field. I am in the field of comparative studies. I have had discussions with great scholars, great pundits, great priests. Whatever question they pose, I have an answer, alhamdulillah. But the thing is that this is a question answer time. We have interjected a couple of times. I have given the answer because the elderly person. We love you, brother. We love you. We want you to come for our programs always. But, <laughs> but if you allow me to complete the whole answer, and if there is any discussion, you are most welcome to ask the next question at the end of the row. So even animals have got no souls according to Islam. Animals have no soul. So if that's their logic, then why don't they have animals? There was a person who argued with me and said, okay, we believe that the plants have got life, but plants can't feel pain. Therefore, killing a plant is less a crime as compared to killing animals. Today, science is advanced and we have come to know that even plants can feel pain. They can even cry. They can even feel happy. So your logic has failed. So one person, like our elderly brother out here, he was arguing and told me, that okay, I agree that plants have got life, plants can feel pain, but the plants have got lesser senses as compared to animals. Therefore, killing a plant is a lesser crime as compared to killing an animal. So I said, okay, for sake of argument, I agree with you. Plants have lesser senses. But then I asked him the question, suppose your brother, if he's born deaf and dumb, two senses less, and if someone kills him, will you go and tell the judge, oh Lord, oh judge, Please give the murderer less punishment because my brother had two senses less. <laughs> the logic doesn't work like that. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that I have given the good things for you to eat. Of the good things and the halal things, you can have. So Muslims can very well have those non-veg which Quran and Hadith have permitted. I hope that answers the question. The next question from the lady section. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, I just wanted to ask you a small question that as you said that uh, non-Muslims we can, uh, it's better to give Arabic text with the uh, translation. So we don't uh, touch the Holy Quran with, without wazoo. We know like what is ghusl and wazoo. So they are allowed to read like that uh, without wazoo. Or, and uh, one, excuse me one small more question that during traveling the compact Quran Sharif is allowed, you said it's good to read instead of going into other things. So that time also wuzu is required, no? Like traveling full time you need to have wuzu, no? The sister asked a question that don't we require to have wudu when we read the translation or the Arabic Quran and when we give the Arabic Quran to non-Muslims without wudu how can they touch? Regarding wudu is required or not sister? There are various different schools of thought, various different schools of thought. And when they quote the quotation which I said, Surah Waqiyah chapter 56, verse 77 and 80, 
that quotation does not refer to human beings it refers to angels and i said in my talk that they prove it from the quran you should have wudu it's a misinterpretation and i have given you several references it actually refers to the angels it doesn't refer to human being but there are different schools of thought for example the hanafi the shafi the maliki the hanbali each one have their different school of thought the hanafi says that you cannot touch without wudu but if it's covered with a piece of cloth you can touch it some hanafi scholars say that the cover itself the hard cover itself comes in between so you can touch the quran without a cloth but with a cover some say you can touch the quran but not the arabic text various views among the shafis the shafi scholars say that you cannot touch without wudu even if it has a cover various views maliki says somewhat similar but the maliki say that if a student wants to learn the quran and if a teacher wants to teach the quran even without wudu they can touch even if they are in the stage of danaba of ceremonial impurities the maliki school of thought says that you can touch if he is a student who wants to learn the quran and if he is a teacher who wants to teach the quran because otherwise the ladies who are doing hifz of the quran they will forget within the few days different school of thought humbly different school of thought if you analyze if you analyze that even the zahiri school of thought what they say and ibn hazm he has discussed this thing in detail according to ibn hazm he says there is no prerequisite there is no condition at all for touching the quran but natural all scholars agreed wudu is preferable but according to ibn hazm he has quoted several hadith several quranic referencing there is no authentic hadith which clearly specifies that any condition is required you can even touch the quran without wudu you can even touch if you are in ceremonial impurities according to ibn hazm various different opinions but if you analyze that even the hadith with the scholars quote of the muatta that you should be tahirin the person should be tahir tahirin pure if you analyze the arabic word it actually means those who are pure it does not refer to those who are in wudu only and this comment you can find in uh, sayyid abul ala maududi in dawatul quran of uh, shampir dada in ibn qasir in zamakhshari in various that it refers mainly that you should not be in ceremonial impurities even if you agree that the hadith is sahih that tahirin means that you should not be in ceremonial impurity if you are in ceremonial impurity with after sexual intercourse or if you are having menstrual cycles at that time you should not touch according to that hadith if it is sahih it doesn't refer that you should be in wudu but there are different schools of thought you can ask them why they think that way but i agree with it totally that with wudu is much preferable but touching without wudu is not haram because nowhere does the quran say neither does any sahih hadith say about that regarding can it be given on muslim according to ibn hazm even a muslim can touch in the state of ceremonial impurities whether it's right or wrong you can refer to his books and check it up but if you agree with that a non muslim can also touch but my main argument which i put forward as the quran says reason with the people with hikma udu ila sabili rabbika bil hikma wal ma uzat al hasna wajadulum billati ahsan from surah nahl chapter 16 verse 125 he says invite all the way of the lord with wisdom and beautiful preaching and argue with them and reason with them in the ways that are best and most gracious if you analyze the quran gives a challenge one of the challenge i mentioned in the answer to alif lam mim that try and produce a surah like the holy quran if all the human beings got together the quran says in surah isra chapter 17 verse number 88 that if all the human beings got together along with the jinns they will not be able to produce the like of the quran and again the quran says in surah nisa chapter 4 verse 82 it says afala yatadabbarun alqur'ana walau qana min indi ghairillah lawajudu fi ikhtilafan kathira they do not they consider the quran with care had it been from anyone besides allah there would have been many contradictions there would have been many discrepancies so quran gives a challenge to those who don't believe in the quran the non muslims that do you not consider the quran with care had it been from anyone besides allah there would have been contradictions so when the non muslim has to consider the quran when allah gives a challenge what naturally has to hold it in the hand he can't check whether the quran has contradiction or without holding it so when allah gives a challenge to them and if they can hold it then who are we to stop them and if allah holds me responsible on the day of judgment i said in my talk i will be in the company of my beloved prophet when the beloved prophet 
can give verses of the Quran to non-Muslim, do you think you are more holier than the Prophet? You are more holier than the Prophet? Prophet gave verses of the Quran to non-Muslims. So why can't we give? So if you analyze and read the Quran with understanding and the Sahih Hadith with understanding, you will realize that we should deliver the message to the whole of humankind, including non-Muslim, as well as give them the message of the Holy Quran. Hope that answers the question. Good night. I wish to express my sincere appreciation for the marvelous task that you have performed today. Alhamdulillah, you have done a splendid job. And I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that Allah gives me and all the boys present here and everyone present here to implement all the things that you have disclosed today. Coming to my question is, I would like to ask you regarding one question which ponders some non-Muslims allege that the Quran which we Muslims possess today was compiled under the authority of the third caliph, Usman radiallahu ta'ala anhu. So they say, how do you prove that it is the word of God? Could you please express your views on that? <coughs> the brother has posed a very important question, and I do agree with him. Muslims will allege that the Holy Quran you have today has been compiled and authorized by the third Khalifa, Hazrat Usman, may Allah be pleased with him. And all the remaining copies he burned. So but naturally there are many types of Quran, and only one has been authorized and compiled by Hazrat Usman. Therefore, may Allah be pleased with him. Therefore, there were many versions, and the one that you have may not be the word of God, etc., etc. Regarding how to prove it is the word of God, you can refer to my video cassette, Is the Quran the word of God? That this Quran, logically, you can prove it is the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Regarding why did he burn, did he compile, etc., it's completely wrong to say that Hazrat Usman, may Allah be pleased with him, he is the person who compiled the Quran and authorized it. In fact, the Quran was compiled in the presence of the beloved Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Whenever any verse of the Holy Quran was revealed to a beloved Prophet, he immediately memorized it and then proclaimed it to his Sahabas. Their Sahabas memorized it and immediately the Prophet asked the Sahabas to write it down. And whenever it was written down, the Prophet checked it. We know very well the Prophet was Ummi. He could not read or write, but he had a method of checking. For example, the first two verses to be revealed of Surah Ikhra, Surah Alaq, chapter 96, verse 1 and 2, is Ikhra bismi rabbikal lazi khalaq, khalaqal insami alaq. He recited that, dictated to the sahabas, they wrote it down. After they wrote it down, the Prophet said, read it now, so they read. Ikhra bismi rabbikal lazi khalaq, khalaqal insami alaq. Okay, correct. If there was a mistake, he used to correct it. So whatever was revealed, he used to tell the sahabas, he used to memorize it, sahabas used to memorize it, he used to check the memory of the sahabas, whether they memorized it correctly or not. Then, after that, when they wrote it, he used to check whether the written material is right or wrong. And whenever any revelation came, he even told the scribes that this verse of the Holy Quran will come after so and so surah, so and so verse. All this was divine. Because the way the Quran was revealed, we don't have Surah Ikra, verse 1 and 2, in the beginning of the Quran. It is the 96th chapter. So whenever it was revealed, afterwards it was told by a beloved prophet to the scribes that this verse will come after this surah. And this that we have today, the order, is the same order as Allah Mahfuz present in the heaven. Now you should realize one thing, that every Ramadan, Archangel Gabriel, he rehearsed, and the prophet rehearsed whatever was revealed till that time with Archangel Gabriel. And the last Ramadan before the prophet died, this Quran was rehearsed twice, in order. So even the Quran is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, even the order is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But whatever was written down, some of the ayahs of the Quran were written down on camel saddles, some on tanned leather, some on scrap leather, some on flat pieces of thin stones, some on leafless palm leaves, some on shoulder blades, different material. After the Prophet expired, at the time of the first Khalifa, Hazrat Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, after a couple of years, in the Battle of Yamama, there were several Huffas, those who know the Quran by memory, by heart, they were killed in the battle. So that was a thing which troubled Hazrat Abu Bakr and even Hazrat Umar, may Allah be pleased with them both. So then, Hazrat Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, he called all the scribes who wrote 
when the Prophet used to recite to them. And he appointed Hazrat Zaid bin Thabit, who was the best of the scribes, who had the best memory. He said, now what you do, you collect all the material and put it in one material. The Quran was compiled, the order was present, but it was not present in one material, in different materials, stones, shoulder blade, leather, etc. So what under the supervision of Hazrat Zayed bin Thabit, may Allah be pleased with him, along with the other Sahabas, all this material was copied in one material, in order. So present and stitched in a sort of a book form was done by Hazrat Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him. But the order and everything was already present in same sheet. It was done by Hazrat Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him. This copy was later given to Hazrat Omar, may Allah be pleased with him, when he became the second Khalifa. And after he expired, he gave it to his daughter, Hazrat Hafsa, may Allah be pleased with her, who was also the wife of the beloved Prophet. Now, during the reign of Hazrat Usman, may Allah be pleased with him, there were certain disagreements between the Muslims who stayed far away, since Islam kept on spreading. Islam spread, there was some disagreement regarding the dialect, regarding the pronunciation of the Quran, in which there were arguments between the Muslims. So to prevent the argument, Hazrat Usman, may Allah be pleased with him, he said that we have to see to it that the correct copy reaches the various parts of the Muslim world. So what he did, he called again those scribes and took the copy from Hazrat Hafsa, may Allah be pleased with her, who was the wife of the beloved Prophet and the daughter of Hazrat Omar, may Allah be pleased with him. And he asked the scribes under again a committee to copy it again. And after copying, he asked the Muslim world that whatever copy that you have with you, you burn it. Why? There was a reason. Because every time the Prophet proclaimed a certain verse of the Holy Quran, many Sahabas wrote it down. But it's not possible that all the Sahabas knew each and every verse. Some may not be present when the Prophet said. So if someone has, instead of more than 6,000 verses, he may have 5,000 verses. He may think that these 5,000 verses are complete Quran. So to prevent that, and whatever they wrote down, the Prophet didn't check it personally. Prophet didn't go to every Sahaba's house and, oh, what do you write, show it to me. No. When he recited, people wrote down. It was not checked by the Prophet personally. Since it was not checked by the Prophet, there were chances that these copies which people have with them may carry mistakes. So for that reason, Hazrat Usman said, burn the other copies. Not because to say that there were many versions of the Quran. There was only one authorized, compiled copy of the Holy Quran during the time of the Prophet. The same copy, to make it more easily accessible to the world, he had it sent to various parts of the Muslim Ummah, various parts. Later on, after that, the Arabs could read. There were no Fatta Dhamma Kasara, no diacritical marks were there on the Quran. Because the Arabs can read without the vowels, without the diacritical marks. Later on, the fifth Yamat Khalifa, under the reign of Abdul Malik Marwan, from 66 to 86, Hijri. Under him, there was a governor in Iraq, Yusuf bin Ajjad. He gave the diacritical marks, Fatta Dhamma Kasra, which we call as Zabar Zirpesh in India, so that the people could pronounce the Quran, those who are non Arabs, who do not know Arabic as a language, they could pronounce it easier. So, even what we have today, Fatta Dhamma Kasra, the copy which was originally dictated copied from the original source by Hazrat Zaid bin Thabit and then given to various parts of the world. One such copy is yet present in the Koptaki Museum in Turkey. It's present there. It's present there. If you check up, it's the same. But it will be without the diacritical marks. But just because the diacritical marks are different, that does not mean Quran is different. Because Quran is a recitation. If any Arab who knows how to recite the Quran without the Fatta Dhamma Kasara, if you recite that Quran and if you recite this Quran, it's 100% the same. There will be no difference. So Alhamdulillah, the Quran that we have was under the personal supervision of our beloved Prophet Muhammad It was compiled and what we have today was actually compiled by the beloved Prophet Muhammad It was made accessible to us by Hazrat Usman. And whatever Allah says in the Quran has come true, He clearly says in Surah Al-Hijr chapter 15 verse number 9 that we have revealed the Holy Quran and we will guard it from corruption. Hope that answers the question. Assalamu alaikum brother, uh, my question is, how would you reply to a non-Muslim who says that Quran is written by a Satan? Thank you.
The sister posed the question that how will you reply to a non-Muslim who says that Quran has been written by Satan? Sister, if, if, big if, if Satan had written the Quran, why would he mention in Surah Nahal, chapter 16, verse number 98, that when you recite the Quran, say, Auz Billah Himmina Shaitan Rajim. Why will Satan write it in his own book that whenever you recite my book, say, I seek refuge with Allah from Satan the accursed? Why will Satan write in his own book? Why will he curse himself in his own book? Further, if you read Quran, says in Surah Araf, chapter 7, verse number 200, that whenever you get a message from Satan, seek refuge with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Why will the Satan himself write in his own book that when you hear a message from me, you go and seek refuge with Allah? And for the Satan, Allah is an avowed enemy. So why will he say that go to my enemy and seek refuge? And further, if you analyze that these allegations are not new allegations. These allegations are very old. Even when the revelation came to the prophet, even the pagans at that time said that these revelations is from Satan. That's the reason that the verses of Surah Waqiyah, which I quoted in my talk, chapter 56, verse number 77 to 80, it was revealed in reply to the allegations laid by the mushriks of Makkah that the prophet receives the revelation from the Satan. And this revelation says, again I'm quoting, that the Quran is the book most honorable. It's a book well guarded, well protected, who none can touch but those who are pure and clean. This is a revelation from the Lord of the world saying that this Kitab in Maknoon, this well protected book, which is then the Lohe Mahfuz, none can touch but the angel, those are pure, and we know devil is not pure. So Quran is saying, the devil, the Satan, can come nowhere close to Lohe Mahfuz. Nowhere close. So it's impossible that he can bring this revelation. It's further again confirmed in the Holy Quran in Surah Al-Shura, chapter 26, verse number 210 to 212, that no Satan has bought this Holy Quran, the revelation of the Holy Quran. It does not suit him, neither can he produce it. And we have kept him so far that he cannot even hear it. So the Quran itself says that this book is not from Satan. To prove it's the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you can see my video cassette is the Quran, the word of God. Assalamu alaikum. My name is Sarfraz and my question is, is it correct to have Quran Khani, that is reciting of the whole Quran during an opening ceremony or on the death of any Muslim. The brother asked the question that, is it right to recite the Quran, have Quran Khani, recite the Quran in opening ceremonies, death of a person. And when we ask some of the Muslims that why was the Quran revealed, some people say it was revealed to be recited during opening ceremony for housewarming ceremony, when a person dies. There is no authentic hadith which I know of, neither any verse of the Holy Quran, which says that the Prophet did this thing. People gather there, they collect, and they rattle the Holy Quran at 100 miles per hour. I've got no objection if people want to complete the research of the Holy Quran. Alhamdulillah, it's good. But what I say, that if you call 30 people to recite the Holy Quran, each one reads the para of the Arabic text, I tell them, why don't you call 60 people? Instead of reading one para of the Holy Quran Arabic, it's preferable you recite half para along with translation and call 60 people. If they're less people, then instead of they taking one hour per para, tell them you take two hours. Take two hours for completing the Quran. Have Fahmul Quran. Have Fahmul Quran. And you read the Arabic text and along with that, read the translation. Irrespective whether it serves the purpose or not. Surely, the person who reads the Quran with understanding, it will surely benefit him. He will get sawab. Surely, it will help him in his life. It will be a guidance to his lifestyle. So if anyone wants to recite the full Quran, I'm for it, but have Fahmul Quran. Recite along with the translation. Hope that answers the question. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, during the course of a discussion, I was confronted with a question like this, that the Muslims believe in the theory of abrogation. That is, certain early verses of the Quran, which were mansook, were abrogated by later revealed verses. Now, does this imply that God was wrong and later corrected 
the voices. The sisters asked the question that there are certain Muslims who believe in the abrogation theory and certain verses were revealed later on and the earlier verses were abrogated. So is there a contradiction in the Holy Quran and did Allah make a mistake and then correct it? Sister, the theory of abrogation is derived from a verse in the Holy Quran from Surah Al-Baqarah, chapter 2, verse number 106, which says that we cause not any verse or any revelation to be abrogated or forgotten, but we substitute it with things similar or better. And Allah has power over all things. The same message is repeated again in Surah Nahal, chapter 16, verse number 120, that Allah does not cause to be forgotten, but He substitutes it with things better or similar. The Arabic word here is ayah, which can be translated as revelation, also as signs, as verses. If you take it as a revelation, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't cause the previous revelations to be forgotten, but substitute it with revelations which are better or similar, but naturally it refers to that the previous revelations, the Torah, the Zabur, the Injil, they have been substituted by the last and final revelation, the Holy Quran, which, but natural, no Muslim should have objection to. If you take the meaning as ayah, as verses of the Quran only, then the Quran will say that we do not cause any verses of the Holy Quran to be forgotten, but we substitute it with something better or similar. If we take ayah as verse of the Holy Quran, that means other verses have been revealed which are better or similar. But this does not mean that the verse which was revealed earlier no longer holds good today and it contradicts. There are many Muslims who misunderstand this second interpretation. And they say it means that the verses that were revealed earlier, they have been abrogated. They no longer hold good. We should not follow it. We have to follow that same verse dealing with the same topic which was revealed later on. And they feel that the verse revealed earlier contradicts with the verse which was revealed later. Therefore, we Muslims should only follow the later verse and not the first verse. There is a little bit of misunderstanding about this concept. Let me give you an example that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reveals certain things. Later on, he reveals verses dealing with the same topic, with the same subject. But that does not mean there is a contradiction. He gives you additional information. After giving that additional information, the verses that were revealed later on is sufficient to speak about that subject. But that does not mean it contradicts with the early verses. Let me give you an example that regarding the challenge which I mentioned in one of my answers, that produce a surah like it. First, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives the challenge to the humankind. In Surah Isra, chapter 17, verse 88, that if all the human beings and the jinns, they got together, they would not be able to produce a recital like the Holy Quran. The same message is repeated in Surah Tur, chapter 52, verse 34, that you cannot produce the Holy Quran, even if all the men and Jinns got together. You can't produce the Holy Quran. Then the challenge is made easier in Surah Hud, chapter 11, verse number 13, that you will not be able to produce even 10 surahs. Then further on in Surah Yunus, chapter 10, verse 38, the challenge is further simplified. You can't even produce one surah. And in Surah Bakra, chapter 2, verse number 23, 24, which I recited earlier, the challenge is made more easier that you will not be able to produce a surah somewhat similar to the Holy Quran. Surah Yunus chapter 10 verse 38 says, can't produce a surah like the Quran. Surah Bakra chapter 2 verse 23, 24 says, you can't even produce a surah somewhat similar to the Holy Quran. The challenge is made easier. That does not mean that the earlier challenge does not hold good. Suppose if I tell a person who is dumb, who is ignorant, that you dumb person, you can't even pass standard 10. Then after a few minutes, I realize he's more dumb. I tell him, you can't even pass standard five. Then I say, you can't even pass standard one. Then I say, you can't even pass the nursery, KG. That does not mean I'm contradicting. But my last statement, that you can't even pass nursery, includes the first three statements. When I say, you can't pass nursery, it's taken for granted, you can't even pass standard one, standard five, and standard 10. That does not mean it's contradicting. 
When I say you can't pass standard 10, you can't pass standard kg, it's not contradicting. Contradiction is something which you can't follow simultaneously. If you can follow simultaneously both the verses of the Quran, it's not a contradiction. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is simplifying the challenge. Some people say no, the first verse of Surah Isra chapter 17 verse 88 is wrong, it should not be followed today. They don't understand. They think it's a contradiction because of the lack of understanding. It's not a contradiction. Contradiction is something which is opposing. Let me give you one more example. The prohibition of intoxicants in the Quran came down in stages. The first verse dealing with intoxicants was Surah Al-Baqarah chapter 2 verse number 219 which says that when they ask thee concerning wine and gambling, tell them in it is loss and profit. But the loss is more than the profit. The next verse dealing with intoxicants, see the prohibition came in stages, why? Because to reform the Arab society, it had to be done in stages. They were alcoholics, they were drunkards, it was difficult to reform them, it came in stages. The next verse dealing with intoxicants was of Surah Nisa, chapter 4, verse 43, which says that do not pray with your mind before, while praying, having intoxicants is haram. And the final prohibition was revealed, that's mentioned in Surah Maida, chapter 5, verse number 90, which says, Ya ayyuhal ladina amun, O you who believe, innam al khamru al maithru, most certainly intoxicants and gambling, wal anzabu al azlamu, dedication of stones, divination of arrows, rushtam min amli shaitan, these are Satan's handiwork, pashtanibu lalakum tuflihun, abstain from such handiwork that you may prosper. After this verse was revealed, there was total prohibition of alcohol, 100%. That does not mean that this verse contradicts with the early verse. Even the early verse is correct. That in the alcohol, there is loss and profit. The loss is more than profit. It's not nullified. Even the second revelation, Surah Nisa chapter 4 verse 43 says that do not pray with your mind before the whole goods. What people are misunderstanding, that if the Quran says do not pray with your mind before, that means if you're not praying, alcohol is allowed. That's the misunderstanding. If the Quran would have said that do not pray with your mind befogged and you can have alcohol when you're not praying, then there's a contradiction. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is most wise. He knows what he's going to reveal. He can't make a mistake. So that to bring the prohibition in stages, at that time only having alcohol during salah was prohibited. Quran does not say other time it's halal, it's silent. If you would have mentioned while not praying you can have alcohol, and then afterwards say it is prohibited for always, then there's a contradiction. So people, because they can't reason out the compatibility between the two verses, they have come out that it contradicts, therefore you should not follow the other verses. For example, if I tell my friend, that see, when you're touring, don't go to New York. Then I tell him, don't go to USA. Then I say, don't go to America, the continent of America. I'm not contradicting. I'm giving him more and more information. First time saying, don't go to New York, don't go to USA, don't go to America. But when I say don't go to the continent of America, even USA is included, even Canada is included, even New York is included. If I say don't go to continent of America, it is sufficient enough. I need not again say don't go to USA or don't go to New York. Therefore, when Quran says that alcohol is totally prohibited, it includes Surah Nisa chapter 4, 43, that even while praying it is haram. But that does not mean it's contradicting. It's giving you more information. Therefore, anyone who says that the verses of Quran contradict, that's the meaning of abrogation theory, then they have failed to understand the Quran because the Quran says in Surah Nisa chapter 4 verse 82, Afala yatadabbarun al-Qurana walau kana minindi gairilla lavajudu fi iktilafan kafiro. They do not they consider the Quran with care. Had it been from anyone besides Allah, there would have been many contradictions. So there is something like Mansook, but Mansook does not mean contradicting, it means better information. Hope that answers the question. Brother Zakir, my question is, all Muslims follow one and the same Quran, then why are there so many sects among Muslims? So brother posed the question that if all the Muslims follow one and the same Quran, Alhamdulillah, then why are there so many sects that we have? The Holy Quran says in Surah Al-Imran, 
chapter 3, verse number 103 says, Wa tasimu bi hablillahi jamiyo, wala tafaruku. Hold all together fastly to the rope which Allah stretches out and be not divided. Allah says, hold to the rope of Allah. Which is the rope of Allah? The Holy Quran. Allah says, if the Muslims hold to the rope of Allah, and it says, hold together and be not divided. Double emphasis. Besides holding together, also be united. Double emphasis. But when we ask a person, who is he? Some say Shia, some say Sunni, some say Hanafi, some say Shafi. The Holy Quran says in Surah Anam, chapter 6, verse number 159, that anyone who divides the religion and makes sex, you have nothing to do with him. And Allah will tell him the truth. But when you ask a person that who are you? Some Muslims say that I'm a Hanafi, some say I'm a Shafi, some say I'm a Hanbali, some say I'm a Malaki, some say Shia, some say Sunni, some say Deobandi, some say Barevli, some say Aga Khani, some say Boris. Who are the beloved prophets? Hanafi? Was the Shafi? Was the Malaki? Was the Shia? Was the Sunni? He was a Muslim. The Holy Quran says in Surah Al-Imran chapter 3 verse 52 that Isa was a Muslim. The Holy Quran says in Surah Al-Imran chapter 3 verse 67 that Abraham alayhi salam, he was not a Jew or a Christian, he was a Muslim. Our beloved Prophet, he was a Muslim. Nowhere does the Holy Quran say that you should say you are a Hanafi or a Shafi or a Hanbali or a Malaki. The Holy Quran says in Surah Fusilat chapter 41 verse number 33, Qala inna ni minal muslimin. Say I am of those who bow in the will of Allah. Say I am amongst the Muslims. The Holy Quran says, in Surah Al-Imran chapter 3 verse 64, the same verse which our beloved Prophet dictated to non-Muslim kings when inviting them towards Islam. It says that, فَقُولُ shadu bianna muslimun. I bear witness that I am a Muslim. The Prophet never said that I am bear witness that I am a Hanafi or a Shafi or a Maliki or a Deobandi. No. He said, I bear witness I am a Muslim. All these four great scholars, Imam Abu Hanifa, Imam Shafi, Imam Malik, Imam, humble. Alhamdulillah, I respect them. They were great scholars. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward them for their research and for their hard work. Inshallah, they'll get the reward. But if anyone poses the question, if someone agrees with the teachings, with the views of Imam Abu Hanifa, Imam Shafi, Imam Humble, Imam Malik, I've got no objection. If someone follows certain views of Abu Hanifa, Imam Abu Hanifa, may Allah be pleased with him. Imam Shafi, may Allah be pleased with him. With Imam Hanbal, may Allah be pleased with him. Imam Malik, may Allah be pleased with him. If you follow certain views, I have got no objection. But if someone asks you the question, what are you? You should say, I'm a Muslim. There are certain people who argue, that see our beloved Prophet said, that my Ummah will be divided into 73 sects. And they're quoting a hadith, which is there in Abu Dawud, hadith number 4579. And it does say that a beloved Prophet said, that my ummah will be divided into 73 sects. A prophet said a ummah will be divided. He never said you should be divided. The Holy Quran says, Wa tasimu bi hablillahi jamia wala tafaraku. Hold to the rope of Allah strongly, be not divided. Holy Quran says, Pure Anam chapter 6, verse 159, do not be divided. Don't make sex in your religion. Holy Prophet also never said make sex. He predicted there will be sex. And the other hadith, which mentioned Tirmidhi, Hadith number 171. It says that the Prophet said, my Ummah will be fragmented into 73 sects. And all of them will go to hellfire except one. When the companions asked him, that, oh Prophet, which one? The Prophet said, those who follow me and my companions. Those who are amongst me and my companions. The Quran says, Atiullah wa Atiur Rasul. So anyone follows the Holy Quran and the Sahih Hadith, he is on the true path. I have got no objection if somebody believes with great scholars, with their views, as long as it matches with the Quran and the Sahih Hadith. But let him be the biggest scholar in the world. If it view disagrees, contradicts with the Quran and the Sahih Hadith, you don't have to follow that. If the Muslim Ummah reads the Holy Quran with understanding, inshallah, this problem will be solved. Hope that answers the question. Uh, we'll give a preference to the slips. Also, I said secondary preference to the slips, not no preference to the slips. I think we have to give the slips also some opportunity. Why was the Holy Quran revealed in Arabic 
and as you have rightly pointed out the arabic language as such should be taught from childhood for obvious reasons what is the irf doing to achieve this end in the existing context of the system of education in our country mc abbas business and secretary of arabic academy hyderabad the first question posed was why was the holy quran revealed in arabic and second is what efforts is the irf making in this field the holy quran though it is meant for the whole of humankind for the whole of humanity the reason it was even in arabic is because the holy quran was revealed in arabia and it had to be revealed in the language of that land it can't be revealed in a foreign language similarly even the previous revelation like torah zabur injil they were revealed in hebrew in the language of that land so when a revelation comes in a land it should be in the language of that land point number 2 that since it was revealed to the last and final messenger prophet muhammad peace be upon him but natural it had to be in his mother tongue if the quran was revealed in a language which was foreign to the messenger on whom it was revealed then surely those people who knew the language better those people whose mother tongue was the language of the quran surely they would approach the prophet and say that what will you explain to us about a book whose language is our mother tongue and it's not your mother tongue so but natural it had to be revealed in the language which was familiar which was the mother tongue of the last and final messenger prophet muhammad peace be upon him which was arabic besides that arabic though it's an ancient language yet it is a living language there are more than 150 million people who yet today speak arabic more than 150 million people the other languages in which the other scriptures are present like sanskrit ancient hebrew aramaic all these are dead languages only a handful of scholars know these languages so if anyone wants to change that scripture it's very easy no one will come to know but today suppose someone wants to change the arabic quran it will be impossible there are more than 150 million people who know arabic as a language though it's ancient is a living language i said in my talk that arabic is a rich language every word has got a deep meaning sometimes you may require several words or even sentences to describe its meaning the arabic many words in it have got several meaning many a time more than one imply for example the first two verses of the holy quran to be revealed from surah ikra or surah alaq chapter 96 verse number 1 and 2 was ikra bismi rabbik allazi khalaq khalaqal insana min alaq the arabic word ikra it means read it also means recite it also means proclaim the arabic word rab besides meaning lord it also means sustainer and cherisher and provider the arabic word khalaqa has got another few meanings beside meaning creator it can mean something which is created from nothing it can mean something which is created from pre existing material khalaqa also means to plan to program khalaqa also means to make smooth the arabic word alaqa it means congealed clot of blood it means something which clings it means a leech like substance so if i have to translate correctly i'll have to translate the verse of ikra bismi rabbik allazi khalaq khalaq al insana min alaq as read recite proclaim in the name of your lord cherisher sustainer provider who created who planned who programmed who made smooth khalaq khalaq al insana min alaq who created the human being from something which clings a leech like substance a congealed clot of blood difficult arabic language is rich therefore in short way telegraphic message it can convey a lot of message there are various ways of reading the quran one is tadabbur e quran reading superficial meaning one is tadabbur e quran having a deep meaning you read the arabic portion of the quran even if you read a thousand times you won't get tired you will enjoy it the more you read and besides that if you analyze that arabic to write arabic it requires less space for example if i write muhammad meem ha meem dal 
Pata Dhamma comes on top, top down, Pata Dhamma Kasara. I want to repeat meme letter, just Prashadda, shortcut. If I have read in English, I have to write M-U-H-U-M-M-E-D or M-O-H-A-M-M-E-D. If you analyze the time taken, the space taken, the ink taken and the energy taken to write Arabic as compared to English language and other language, it is one third to half. Less space required, less ink required, less energy, less time. And just because the Quran was revealed in Arabic, that does not mean it is not meant for the full world, for the whole of humanity. Suppose a French doctor, he does a research in French regarding the treatment of a certain disease. That does not mean that treatment can't be used in USA and India. It can be used. And if someone wants to analyze that treatment, he can either learn French as a language and analyze the research, or he can have the translation read. Similarly, the Arabic Quran was revealed for the whole of humankind. They can either learn Arabic, or they can read the translation to acquire the guidance. Hope that answers the question. Next question, why do some Muslims write 786 for Bismillah? Is it correct? The question posed was that why do people, some Muslims, write 786 for Bismillah and is it correct? There are some of the Muslims who have given certain numerical values for certain Arabic alphabets. And when you add up this value, you get a certain figure. So the people, some people write 786, because if you add up the value of Ba, Seen, Bismillah, each letter of, of Bismillah, if you add up the value, it comes to a total of 786. Similarly, some people write 92 for Muhammad, peace be upon him, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. If you add up the value of each letter of his name, it comes to 92. Whether it's right or wrong, I do not find any Sahih Hadith or any Quranic verses which agrees with the system of shortcut. There are some Muslims who argue with me and tell me that see, since we cannot write the Arabic Bismillah Rahman name on invitation cards, on the letterhead, therefore we write 786. I said if you can't write the Arabic portion, write the transliteration. Bismillah Rahman name, B I S M I L L A H, no problem. Otherwise write the translation. If the person doesn't know Arabic also he can Understand, in the name of Allah, most gracious, most merciful. And this sickness of numerical values is present in various societies throughout the world. Some people consider number 13 as unlucky. Number 666, 666 is a sign for the devil. In the Indian context, we use char so 420, for a person who is a fraud. This 420 number has certain logical base. Many of us don't know. The reason we call a fraud or a person who cheats a 420 is because if he is arrested and if he goes to a court of law, the Indian court of law will give him a punishment under the Indian Penal Code 420. So Indian Penal Code 420 gives the punishment for a fraud. Therefore, we call a fraud a char 420. But unfortunately, even the Muslims which migrate to America and UK, they call the robbers of UK also 420. <laughs> See, there, there the number will be different, it won't be 420. People don't know the meaning, but they use the charge of 420. But even if I agree with these people that certain Arabic numerals have certain value, but logically speaking, giving a particular number by totaling the letters of that word and using the short form is illogical because that same number can be used even for other words. Some may be good, some may be bad. For example, if I say the English letter B, it has got numerical value 1, A has got 7, and uh, say D has got 4. If you add up, it comes to 12. 1 plus 4 plus 7, 12. B plus A plus D, 12. Suppose I say that for G, the numerical value is 2. For O, it is 3. And for D, it is 4. So if I add up G plus G plus O plus O plus D, it will come 2 plus 3 plus 3 plus 4, 12. So if I use 12 short form for good, it also means bad. So similarly, 786, if you add up the Arabic numerals, even if it comes to 786, there will be several other words and several other sentences. The total will also come to 786. Some will be good, some will be bad. Therefore, 
I do not agree with any Muslim writing shortcut numericals for Bismillah Rahman Rahim or for any Arabic word of the Holy Quran. Hope that answers the question. Assalamu alaikum. I'm Mrs. Fatima Maka and I have recently joined the Islamic Studies course of Bombay University. Also, I intend to join the Arabic course. I would like to be clear in my mind before doing so. Is Quranic Arabic different from Arabic language taught Arabically? Would it help to understand the Holy Quran better if Arabic is learnt as a language? Tell us from your experience and why doesn't IRF take any step to start such a class? The sisters asked a very important question that is the normal colloquial Arabic spoken in Arabia and the Quranic Arabic the same or different and what steps is IRF taking? And that reminds me that there were two, three question club together and there was a professor of Arabic from Hyderabad who asked this question, but as I said, clubbing questions, the chances I, I may forget, she asked a question that is the colloquial Arabic different from the Quranic Arabic? The colloquial Arabic sister spoken today in the Arab countries is different. There are similarities, but there are differences also because the Arabic of the Quran is Loga Fosa of the Hijaz pure, how you say in Urdu, Fasi Urdu, like that is Loga Fasa, original. There are words which are common, but a normal Arab who only knows colloquial Arabic may not be able to understand everything of the Quran. He may be able to understand quite a large portion of the Quran, but not a few words, because there are certain words of the Holy Quran which are yet used. There are certain parts in Arab countries which still use Loga Fasa, but very few. But the normal which you go to cities, like you have a person, many people go to Saudi Arabia, you know, to do jobs. And within 15 days they learn Arabic. What they learn? Kaifa Haluka, how are you? Ismuki, what's your name? Mirwatun fan. There's no Mirwatun in the Quran. So if you learn the normal colloquial Arabic, it will help you to understand the Quran a little bit more. But I would advise the Muslim to learn Loga Fosa. Loga Fosa. The brother asked the question that what steps have IRF taken? It's unfortunate that I could not find a teacher in Arabic who knows Arabic, Loga Fosa, who can teach in English. There are many Alhamdulillah available in India, but who can teach in English, there are few. And that also what they teach normally in universities and schools is the colloquial Arabic. Same thing, Ismuki, what's your name? They'll talk about Talla Sutun, the duster and the blackboard, and the Khursuyun, the chair. What I wanted, and I approached many people, we had, alhamdulillah, one such session a couple of years ago, which we had, alhamdulillah, about 45 students, out of which about 15 were doctors, 19 were engineers, all, because the course was jam-packed, many applications came, we selected the cream. But due to the rats, unfortunately, rats took place, and the course was not completed in the way that we wanted to be completed. What you should learn today, there are various books also available, various books. The sister asked me, what's my experience? I had a great deal of experience trying to find the teacher, trying to learn myself, but was quite disappointed because what I wanted, I didn't acquire. Neither could I find the teacher, etc. I've approached many people, not in India, throughout the world. Inshallah, we have made a good effort and now very soon, we'll be having a proper course. Amongst the books available, there are, IRF has got more than 50 different books on how to learn Quranic Arabic. The one which are worth mentioning, one of them, which is very simple, by Maulana Abdul Karim Parekh, translated into Urdu first, then someone translated into English. He only mentions first 25 pages about Arabic grammar, very short, very minimal Arabic grammar, and then translates the Arabic words which occur in the fashion which occurs in the Holy Quran. First, dealing with Surah Baqarah, all new words of Arabic in Surah Baqarah. Then Surah Al-Imran, which has been repeated in Surah Baqarah, it won't be repeated in Surah Al-Imran, in this way. This is good, only for a person who's interested in superficial understanding. Because the grammar is not understood well. But for people who have less time, this is fine. Other book without a teacher is by Dr. Ibrahim Surti from Birmingham. From Birmingham. He has a book along with an audio cassette and he gave a talk in IRF a couple of years ago, Learning Quranic Arabic, a modern method. It's a book which is available in IRF and in 60 hours you can learn Quranic Arabic. These two are without teacher. With a teacher, one of the good books is 
by Abdullah Abbas Nadwi. Abdullah Abbas Nadwi, he passed off from Nadwa and now at present in Makkah. What he has done is what we wanted, that give examples of Arabic words which occur in the Holy Quran. So he gives example of apple which is there in the Holy Quran. Those words which occur in the Holy Quran, those words we give examples which is good. But yet we require a teacher for that. The person who I felt is best in my humble research, not that I'm a great scholar, not that I met many people, but I tried to meet and Alhamdulillah I've met all these three people who have written all these three earlier books. The person who was maximum impressed was by Dr. Fah Abdul Rahim of Medina University. Fah Abdul Rahim. He has a novel way of teaching people. And his book, it's available in three volumes, which has also been reprinted in Madras by the Islamic Foundation Trust. It's a book which is followed by various universities throughout the world in teaching Arabic. And he, alhamdulillah, knows several languages. He's a linguist. At present, he's the head of the department of the translation section of the King Fahd printing press. He has been in the Marinda University for more than 25 years. Alhamdulillah, his English is beautiful. He knows Urdu, you know, various languages, Arabic, German, uh, and even uh, French, Spanish, Alhamdulillah. He has a style, while he teaches the foreign student, he learns his language also. And his different approaches, that he teaches a person, for example, he's taken out a book on how to learn the Arabic alphabets. All the books that I've come across start with Alif, Ba, Ta, Sa. His book has a novel approach. He has done a survey since he's from Madras of Tamil language. He says the easiest letter to pronounce in Tamil as compared to the Arabic letter is Lam. So first letter is mentioned in his book is Lam. The other letter which is easier is Meem. So it comes Meem. Moment you learn Lam, along with it, he teaches Fatta Dhamma Kasara. La Li Lu. What we learn normally is Alif Ba, Ya Alif Be Te Se, out there it's Alif Ba Ta Sa. And then after leading all the letters, then we start A, E, U, Ba, B, Bu. This is a different approach. The letter which is easiest pronounced in Tamil language, Islam, so it starts with La, Li, Lu. Then Meem, Ma, Mi, Mu. Then with these two letters, he forms word, Lam, Lim, Lum. And then he says, even a person doesn't know the order, yet he can understand. And then he goes on how to read the Arabic without Fatta Dhamma Kasra. And I had the opportunity to spend time with him for a few days, Alhamdulillah. He is a great scholar and a unique approach. Inshallah, we have requested him to come to IRF. We have requested Abdullah Abbas Nadi to come to IRF. All of them have agreed. So Inshallah, after Ramadan, we may be having such a Quranic course, which Inshallah will be a unique one. And we we'll see to it that we video record it so that people who are not present, though they may not be able to get that same impact, they will at least have the gist of it. Hope that answers the question. Our Hindu brother, the relevant question, therefore I'm just closing the program today with this question and the vote of thanks, I'll be following up. Our Hindu brothers say that in Quran, it is said, cut down the kafirun, so it should be banned. Would you please explain the background of cutting down, or kital, of kafirs, reference to Tawbah? The brother, non-Muslim brother of ours, he has given a reference on Surah Tawbah, that the Quran says, cut down the kafir kill them, so the book should be banned. Can you explain? The brother mentioned the chapter number, he didn't give the verse number. The brother is referring to verse of the Holy Quran from Surah Tawbah, chapter number nine, verse number five, which does say that wherever you find a kafir, kafir, a one who rejects the truth, a mushrik, you kill him. And this verse is quoted very often by the skeptics, by the critics of Islam, especially people like Arun Shuri and Taslima Nasreen. And they say that, see, Islam is a ruthless way of life. It says that wherever you find a kafir, kill him. It brackets, they write Hindu. Indicating that the Quran says wherever you find a Hindu, kill him. They, they are the people who are doing mischief. Mischief. If you analyze, that suppose there is a war going on between Vietnam and America. And the American army general or the American president tells the soldiers in the battlefield, that wherever you find a Vietnamese, kill him. But natural, the army general of America, he's telling to boost up the morale in the battlefield. He has to say that. But today, several years later, if I write 
that the American president or American army general said that wherever you find a Vietnamese, kill him, you'll make him sound like a butcher. It's out of context. So similarly, the context of this verse, you have to read from verse number one. There was a peace treaty between the Mushriks, the Kafirs of Makkah and the Muslims. This peace treaty was unilaterally broken by the Mushriks of Makkah, by the Kafirs of Makkah. At that time, Allah revealed this verse, that we give you a time of four months. Otherwise, our declaration of war. Verse number four says that. Verse number five says that wherever it tells the Muslim, wherever you find the Kafir, kill him. It's to boost up the morale. In the battlefield, these Mushriks who took you out of the house, these Mushriks, if you read the context, they took the Muslims out of the land. These Mushriks today, they have broken the peace treaty. In the battlefield, don't get scared. Fight them, kill them. And after verse number five, Arun Shuri in his book, World of Fatwa, quotes verse number seven. Any logical person understand verse number six is missing. Why? Verse number six gives the answer. Verse number six says that if any of these Kafirs and Mushriks seek asylum, give it to them. Quran does not stop there. Quran says, escort him to a place of security so that he will hear the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Quran does not say when any of these mushriks, these enemies, seek asylum, don't just let him go. Quran says, escort him to a place of security. Tell me which army general today in the world who will be so generous, so merciful, maximum middle soldier that if an enemy wants to go, let him go. Which army general today will say, escort him to a place of security? Quran says, don't just let those kafir go, escort them to a place of security so that they will hear the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So in the battlefield, this context is there. In the battlefield, don't get scared. Fight the people who drive you out of your house. Fight them, those who fight you. Don't get scared. But if they seek asylum, escort them to a place of security. So Islam, alhamdulillah, it promotes communal harmony more than Whatever the, all the others, UNO and human rights, what they're talking today, Quran mentions 14 years ago. <laughs> today, human rights and women rights and so many organizations talking about peace, 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 all that is given in the Holy Quran. But because it comes from the book of the Muslims, they don't want to say, they don't want to quote that. So what today the world is talking about, how to give human rights that you should not differentiate between caste, color, creed, sex, etc. This Quran has already mentioned 14 years ago. It should not be banned. It should be promoted and made and translated into all the various languages of the world and given free. We thank Almighty Allah for making this program possible for all of us here today. On behalf of the IRF, I thank all our esteemed guests and brothers and sisters present here today for their interest and enthusiasm displayed. We appreciate and thank all persons of the professional video recording team, mostly from the USL 20th Century Fox Studios, who have recorded this event for more millions of others to see. Lastly, I would like to congratulate and thank our many volunteers in the organizing committees, all around me and outside, some not watching the program, for their dedicated effort in the organization of this program for all of us. Jazakallah khair. You may keep in touch with the IRF and its regular programs, including watching IRF program broadcast across 68 countries all over the world by the ATN satellite TV channels on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays from 6 to 6.30 a.m. We hope to meet you all again, inshallah, at our next public talk on Concept of God in Major Religions by Dr. Zakir Naik on Sunday, 26th October, 1997 at 9.30 a.m. sharp at Birla Matushri Auditorium next to Bombay Hospital, Mumbai. Jazakallah khair.